We've now seen how we can derive a demand curve from the consumer diagram. We start with an initial budget that contains some initial price, and we find the optimal bundle. At that price, we consume this much of x1, which we can bring down to this lower graph because we're also measuring x1 on the lower graph. So we then have one point on our demand curve. At this price, we're consuming this much of x1. We then said, let's increase the price and put on our substitution effect. So let's take that final budget, shift it parallel until the consumer reaches the original indifference curve. And that gives us our point B. And then we used whatever we knew about the underlying indifference map to locate where we end up on the final budget constraint. That gave us that point C that we brought down at the higher price, the price we called P1 prime, and we had a second point for our demand curve. But we could have also brought down point B. Point B happens at that same price. It has the same budget line slope as the magenta slope. The two slopes are identical. They're parallel lines. So I could bring down point B to the lower picture as well. And we could connect points A and B on the lower picture to get another curve. Now what would that curve tell us? That curve tells us how much of X1 I'm going to consume as the price changes, assuming I get compensated for the price change. So it's a different kind of curve, and it's called a compensated demand curve. But it no longer holds income fixed. On the regular demand curve, we hold income and the price of good 2 fixed. Now we still hold the price of good 2 fixed. But income changes because we're giving compensation as prices rise. So instead, what we're fixing is not income, but the indifference curve. As we get compensated, we always end up on the same indifference curve. So we're fixing the indifference curve to UA. And now asking the question, how much would you consume as prices change if you continue to stay on the same indifference curve? So this is then a demand curve that holds the utility level constant, the indifference curve constant, because it includes the compensation. You can also see that it's derived from two points that arise from a Cayman Island picture. It's a steep budget and a shallow budget fitted to the same indifference curve. So it arises from a pure substitution effect, whereas the regular demand curve also incorporated the income effect because we graphed the point C on the final budget and used that to create the regular demand curve. On that demand curve, we held income and the price of good two fixed. We're going to show in class some uses for this compensated demand curve. But before we get there, let's see how that curve is generally related to the regular demand curve. So in this picture, we've gone back to the same starting point. We can again increase the price, find the compensated budget, get our point B, and bring that point B down to the lower graph. That point P happens at the higher price at the final price, so at the price P1 prime. Now, where does the point C happen, depending on what kind of good X1 is? Well, if X1 is a normal good, then as we take that compensation away, we're reducing your income, and a normal good is a good where if your income falls, you consume less of it. So if x1 is a normal good, 
we're going to consume less, so we're going to end up to the left of point B in this graph, somewhere here. So to the left of point B in this graph, at the same price level, because the blue and the magenta budgets are parallel and contain the same prices. So if the good is a normal good, point C is going to lie somewhere over here. And our regular demand curve is going to be shallower than our compensated demand curve. What if the good X1 is quasi-linear? If it's quasi-linear, then changes in income don't affect how much of good X1 I'm going to consume. Point C is going to appear right below point B, which means it's going to lie right on top of point B in the lower graph at the same price level, because again, these are parallel lines that contain the same price. So in that case, when X1 is quasi-linear, the regular demand curve is going to lie right on top of the compensated demand curve the two demand curves are going to have exactly the same shape. A quasi-linear good is the borderline between a normal and an inferior good. So what if X1 is an inferior good? If X1 is an inferior good, then as we take that compensation away, we're reducing your income. An inferior good is a good where if we're reducing your income, you're going to consume more. So the income effect now pushes us in the opposite direction, and we're going to end up somewhere to the right of point B. If it's a regular inferior good, that income effect isn't going to be so big that it pushes us to the other side of point A. So for a regular inferior good, that point C is going to lie somewhere between A and B, and therefore it's going to lie somewhere between the blue and the green dotted lines here, it's going to lie somewhere here. But that means that when we connect that to point A, the regular demand curve now becomes steeper than the compensated demand curve. Finally, we can think about the strange case of a Giffen good. A Giffen good is a good where if the price increases, we consume more of the good. So when the price increases, we could con would consume more than we did at point A we lie somewhere to the right of point A. The income effect would be so big that it would outweigh the substitution effect. So a Giffen good is an inferior good with a really big income effect relative to the substitution effect. It's a really, really inferior good. And for that kind of good, that point C is going to lie to the right of point A, and the regular demand curve is going to slope up. That's what we indicated when we first introduced Giffen goods. They're goods where an increase in price causes you to consume more of the good, so the demand curve is going to slope up. So we can see now the relationship between the compensated demand curve and the regular demand curve depending on what kind of good X1 is. The compensated demand curve doesn't change as the type of good changes because it's derived from a single indifference curve. It incorporates only the substitution effect. And to find substitution effects, we don't have to know whether the goods are normal, inferior, quasi-linear, homothetic, or anything like that. So since the compensated demand curve incorporates only the substitution effect, it's just derived from the shape of the indifference curve. If we don't change the shape of the indifference curve, we'll have exactly the same compensated demand curve, regardless of what kind of good X1 is. But the regular demand curve will be shallower if the good is normal. It'll be exactly the same as the compensated demand curve if the good is quasi-linear. It'll be steeper if it's inferior. And if it, it'll be upward sloping if it's a given good.